Uh, today is a significant day of remembrance in our country. Um, it was on this day, on this month in 2001, where we witnessed uh, the most horrific, heart-wrenching, demonic attack of terrorists who flew a plane full of Americans into buildings filled with Americans. Um, and, you know, this changed our country and our world as we know it. Yeah, it did. It's one of those events, it's one of those events where um, you remember where you were when it happened, right? Um, I was a college freshman. I was going to Sac State and I was getting ready for school. I remember coming downstairs and my mom had it on the news and uh, they were talking about what was going on, but they had the camera on, you know, the one building that had, had gone down. And so they're talking and talking, talking about it. And I'm just standing there in the living room with my mom. And then all of a sudden we saw the second plane come and hit the second building. And I mean, just right away, I just feel like all of America just began to mourn and pray. We began to mourn and pray, you know, and um, you know, every, I feel like every generation has its, you know, its event that marks them, right? Previous generations have had world wars. Um, the generations coming up right now, they are the COVID generation, right? They're dealing with that. But for millennials, this was our moment. This was the thing that marked us. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the attack on the World Trade Center, um, you know, they're still, it started a, a multiple decade war that, that still has major implications today. And so, um, listen, this is something we will never forget. Amen. Something we'll never forget. And so, you know, if, um, you know, if you're impacted, like many of us are impacted, if, if you shed blood for this, if, if you have someone who you know personally who, who died, we, we will never forget. We remember. We will always remember this day. Amen. 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 And it's in that spirit that I, I just want to launch into um, just a, a major event that marked me as well. Uh, last week, um, Amy and I, our family, we were in um, a very important place to us that we call Quantania. It's actually, it, we don't call it, it's called Quantania. It's a Christian campground in the Santa Cruz Mountains. Um, and this is a very, very important and special place to us. Um, this is a place that my family calls the Holy Land. And the reason why we call it the Holy Land, it's, it's the place of my, it's the literal geographical location of my spiritual rebirth. Um, it's also a really important place to Amy and her brother, my brother-in-law, Justin. Um, they grew up going to this camp, and now they're able to say as adults that their children are growing up going to this camp. So it's just a really special place to us. And so as we were there... Um, we started walking around, we were taking in the sights and everything, and I just began to think about, man, it was 20 years ago, this past August, that I stepped on the mound of the softball field on this campground, and I came to faith in Jesus. 20 years ago. Uh, and so we were, we were thinking about, we were just spinning on that and thinking, and obviously last weekend was also significant, as you know. Amy and I had to leave Quantania um, early and come because we wanted to be in service, and I know it was a really weird Sunday. It was Labor Day weekend. We didn't do that to do an okie doke on you guys. It just kind of worked out that way. We wanted to make sure everyone in the room that we wanted there was going to be able to be there. It worked out that way. But we ended up leaving Quantania a day early to come up and make sure we were at the service. And so while we were there, we were just thinking about all this stuff. Man, 20 years, um, transition, that same weekend. And we said, you know, we just need to sit down and pray. And so we, we, got, we sat down, we began to pray with Justin and Susanna, uh, my, my brother and sister-in-law, with uh, also my mother-in-law, Mary, and we just began to just go after God and, and really just ponder all these things. Well, literally as we were praying, our prayer was interrupted because one of my daughters was coming from our cabin and she fell down the stairs. And as she fell down the stairs, she, she ran over to us as we were praying. She was hobbling and yelling because she had really badly injured her foot in the fall. And so we ended up going to the emergency room. And so we're in the emergency room, and I spent hours in the emergency room last Saturday night just pondering what all this could mean. 
And as it turns out, uh, when the x-ray came back, they said she had a dislocated and broken pinky toe. Now, let's combine this with the fact, just follow me on this. You guys follow me? Combine this with the fact that just a couple days later, this past week, one of my other daughters playing basketball really badly jammed her pinky finger. Okay, so, so I right now have one daughter that has a broken pinky toe and another daughter that has a really swollen, banged up pinky finger. All right, now I'm not one to over-spiritualize things, but I, I think there's something here. I think there's something here. And so, uh, you know, as I was, you know, just, just sitting in the, the emergency room, I just started thinking about this. You know, this is a season that we're in right now. This, this transition is a threat to the kingdom of darkness. It is a threat to the kingdom of darkness. And the devil would love to cause dislocation. Huh. He would love to break us. He would love to have us hobbling and limping in an unhealthy way into our next. And so as I was sitting in an emergency room in Watsonville last Saturday night, I just decided, how important is a pinky toe? Like, <laughs> how important is it? And so I just, I just did what we all do, ask Google, right? <laughs> and so I pulled up a site, and this is what it says, okay? One site says, as one takes a step, the foot rolls from lateral to medial in normal foot biomechanics. This motion in which the pinky toe is crucial helps us to push off to the next step. When the pinky toe is damaged or broken, the body suffers from imbalance. And if there's not intentionality in every step, it can lead to a fall. As it turns out, a pinky toe is not just a little piggy. It has everything to do with your ability to transition from one step to the next. And so if the first one is true, then I want you guys to hear the second thing that I got from this, which is that every single one of us is a vital part of our next. Yes. See, maybe you only see yourself as a pinky toe here at the Brock of Roosevelt. I don't even know what that is, but. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe that's how you see yourself, right? But, but please don't undervalue who you are to this church. No one is more important than you are. I mean, think about it this way. Jesus Christ came for you personally. He came for you. He came to die for you personally. Don't underestimate your value. You know, everyone's been, everyone's been asking me the last couple of weeks, what can I do? What can I do? How can I help? What can I do? And my answer was the same on day one as it is today, right? Which is, this is a time right now where we all need to give our best. We need to be the best version of ourselves, right? That's not a, a pat answer, by the way. Um, you know, uh, there are times and seasons in our lives where you just begin to realize, you know what, I'm in a moment where I need to give my best because my best is required. Isn't it? And we understand this, right? This is why our favorite athletes are our favorite athletes, right? Because they show up in big games. They show up when you really need them to be there, right? Amen to all those who play fantasy football, <laughs> right? Um, this, is, this was the case, right? September 11, 2001, where our greatest heroes were who? They're firemen. Why? Because they bravely knew my best is required, and they stormed in to a building that they thought could collapse, and it collapsed. My girls understand this. You know, I, Amy and I, we work really hard to, to give our girls space and to allow them in our home to be human and to work through their flaws and to work through their hangups and, and all the different things that they're working through. But every now and then, Amy and I, we go to our girls and we look them in their eye and we say, hey, it's time to be great. Your best is required. Can you be your best right now? And we have to tell them, hey, 
this is a moment right now where like you can't be both powerful and petty. So choose one. That's for us right now. That's for this house. Pastor uh, Ken said something so amazing on the Zoom as we were talking about this a couple weeks ago. Uh, he said, you know, this is a time where we all need to dig in our heels and we need to stand strong. And so, listen, if you're, uh, this is a long intro, forgive me. But, you know, if, you're proce- if you've been processing the last couple weeks, hello, hello, amen. Even the kids are yelling out. Shandala. But if you're processing this right now, if you're thinking to yourself, man, I don't know what I should do. Should I stay? Should I go? Blah, blah, blah. If you call the Rock of Roseville your home church, then we consider you a very, very important part of this family of families. And this is for you right now. This is for you right now. Amen? Uh, last week, Pastor Francis, he talked about Captain Sully's uh, heroic emergency landing of a plane that had two disabled engines. But I want to take Captain Sully and I want to raise you a man named Max Sylvester. All right, Max Sylvester was a student pilot at an airport in Western Australia in 2019. And hours into his first flight lesson, his instructor, who was flying the plane, his instructor fainted in the cockpit, slumped over in his seat and completely unconscious. Max realized he was descending to his death. Now, now, maybe you think that's where we are right now, okay? Maybe you think that's where we're at. Man, we are descending. Man, there's a problem around here. Maybe we're descending. But, but let, let me remind you, please don't ever forget that we are believers. Do you know that because of the finished work of Jesus Christ, the Bible calls us righteous? Psalms 1, like go, go read Psalm 1. It has some powerful things to say about the righteous. Psalm 1 says that we are like trees planted by streams of water whose leaves don't wither, who bears fruit in season, and everything we do prospers. Don't forget that. Don't sleep on Max Sylvester. Okay, I know he's a student pilot, but here's the deal. He had read his training manual. And because he read his training manual, he had enough sense to contact the control tower. And the control tower walked him step by step to land the plane safely. And so maybe maybe Josh and I look like student pilots to you right now. (laughs) We've read the training manual. We're reading the training manual. And we have reached out to Jesus, who is the control tower. And he's going to lead us step by step. Amen. He's going to lead us step by step. All right. So hang with us. Amen. Amen. You know, you don't know if you're going to get a clap for something like that or people are going to walk out. Like you just, you just say whatever you can. Just say whatever you can. Um, let's pray. Shall we? Let's pray. I'm, I'm excited to preach. I'm, I'm going to start preaching now. If you guys are okay with that. <laughs> Father, I thank you for this time. I thank you for your people. I thank you for your word. Lord, please lead us. God, you said if, if we, as your people, if we would hunger and thirst for righteousness, you would fill us. And so God, fill us right now. I'm even reminded, you know, maybe I'm just hungry or something, but I'm reminded of what you said in Psalm as well, which is taste and see that the Lord is good. Lord, we, we want to, uh, to, to experience you in a way that surpasses even our sensory uh, experience right now. Lord God, come, fill us full with your presence, Lord God. We thank you that you are here. Please minister to us right now. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. amen. So we're in a series that we've been calling If You Only Knew. Uh, And in it, we've been looking at hidden expressions of the gospel in in, in our lives uh, that are hiding in plain sight, uh, that have uh, major implications if we truly understood how God intends to use them for our good. And uh, today I want to look at a parable that Jesus told that's located almost quite literally in the middle of the book of Matthew in a time where when he spoke publicly, he would only speak in parables. Now, what are parables? Parables... 
um, are, if, to, to put it in layman's terms, parables are earthly stories with heavenly meaning. All right? uh, parables are extended metaphors that communicate spiritual principles, and they were understood by those who had ears to hear, that had eyes to see, that had hearts to receive it, but they were harder to understand by any of those who were hard-hearted. And the longer that I have lived, the longer that I lead, I feel like I'm starting to understand more and more why Jesus did this, right? Because for Jesus, particularly at this time in his ministry, um, any time that he would sit down to teach a crowd of people, there were a percentage of people who, when they heard what he said, would be liberated. And there were a percentage of people that, when they heard what he said, it would be the basis of further conflict. And so, you know, sometimes you just grow tired of trying to explain yourself to people who are committed to misunderstanding you. Let's move on. So Matthew chapter 13, verse 44, starting there, Jesus tells two parables that I want to share with us today. So two parables, starting verse 44, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy, he went and sold all that he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Now, the first thing I wanna just say as we begin to look at this uh, passage here is that Jesus was not speaking in the year 2022. We understand that, right? That, that, that there was, this was not a time when no one would believe that a treasure could be found in a, a field, but rather in this time of his, in history, uh, in, this, in this culture, it was actually believable and common to find treasure in a field because in that day, uh, money was a medium of exchange. It was not a commodity, right? It was not a commodity, right? You didn't take your money to a bank where they would pay you interest to use it until you were ready to, to take it back. All right, and so the economic system did not work that way in that time and in that culture, right? And so, you know, the, the Wu-Tang Clan's hit song, Cash Rules Everything Around Me, would not have been a hit, okay, in this culture. They just didn't get it that way. The economic system didn't work that way, all right? Maybe not all that enough millennials in the room for that joke, <laughs> okay? It didn't work that way, right? And so what you did, if you had a lot of cash, if you had a lot of capital, if you had a lot of coin, um, you couldn't invest it at a bank, right? But if you had a lot of it, actually what you, you did is you would hide it. And it was very, very common for you to hide it on your land. And again, because of this culture um, in a time where, you know, the life expectancy was not that long and people would die unexpectedly through war or disease or whatever, um, it was conceivable that you would be working a land and you could find treasure. You could find money hidden on the land. Amen? So just looking at what's on the surface of these stories, you know, I just want us to see what's, what's easy to see. Okay, In the first story, we see that this is not a man of means because it says when he found a treasure, he had to liquidate everything he had to buy the land. All right, it wasn't like he just had something in his pocket to, to buy. He had to go and sell everything he had to go buy the land. All right, but it says in his joy, he had to sell everything he had, right? He had to sell everything. He had to impoverish himself. He had to beggar himself to get this land. But he knew that there was far more in this field than there was that he was paying for the field. And so he was doing it with joy. All right, second story in the other parable, pearls were a lot more valuable in the economy of the day. I heard somewhere um, where it said that Cleopatra had a pearl now, you're not going to believe this, okay? But when you, when you do the, the currency exchange from denarii to U.S. dollars, Cleopatra had a pearl that was worth over $4 billion, okay? Like, that's not a thing today. But in that time, it was possible to do that. So when Jesus talks about a pearl merchant, uh, someone who knows a lot about pearls, who finds one more valuable than all the others, Though he has to sell everything to buy it, he does it. Because he knows that what he's getting is better 
than what he's getting up, even though he has to give up everything, everything. All right, now let me just say this last thing. I wanna give you guys three, three points from the story, but one last thing that I wanna cover before going, because this is gonna be distracting to you if we don't talk about this part, okay? Um, the thing that's gonna be distracting is that Jesus is not saying that these are true stories, all right? He's not saying these are true stories. He's not holding these up as case studies for how we should do business, all right? This is not a lesson in business ethics, okay? Again, parables are extended metaphors that communicate spiritual principles. So you know you are American. You know you are looking at this with Western eyes. You know that you're, you're seeing this with your own current cultural lens. When you hear this story and you think to yourself, well, that's not really a fair business practice. It's not really Christian for this guy to go and buy land from an owner who's not apprised of his worth. Right? That's how you know you're American. All right? but, but, but listen to me. Listen. Grow with me. Okay? Grow with me. Jesus is trying to communicate something. Don't be distracted. All right? Because this is what Jesus is trying to say. I'm going to break this down a little bit, but I just want to say it to you first. Jesus is saying to these people, I am the Savior of the world. And I have come to offer you salvation. I have come bearing gifts. I have come with the treasure of life with God that is so valuable, it'll cost you everything to get it, yet it is still a bargain. That's what Jesus is saying here. And so I want, I want us to, to see three things as we look at these parables, because I think they tell us, they tell us uh, three things. And so to, to fully receive the gospel and to fully enjoy life with God, we need these three things. We need to, number one, surrender the small stuff uh, number two, we need to sell everything else. And number three, we need to joyfully anticipate all that God has for you. Amen? Amen? Surrender the small stuff, sell everything else, joyfully anticipate all God has for you. All right, so let's look at the first one. Surrender the small stuff. Uh, we need to surrender our small admissions and ambitions. Uh, our admissions and our ambitions tend to be too small. Because unless and until you are given spiritual eyes to see it, you will never understand just how much trouble you're in spiritually, okay? You and I needed God himself to come and die in order to save us. And without his help, without his help, we will never understand just how bad our sins are and how wonderful his saving grace is, all right? And so because of that, we tend to come to God expecting to admit a little bit and to get a little bit. Okay, that's how we, we tend to come to God. But the more you read scripture, the more you walk with God, the more that you realize that the gospel says to us that you are not just a sufferer who needs a little bit of help. No, you are a sinner in need of utter salvation, right? The gospel says, oh, you're willing to admit a little bit? No, no, you better be willing to admit a whole lot. But the good news is on the other side, there's a whole lot more that you can have that you never imagined. Uh, uh, Tim Keller, he... Uh, has made this point talking about the gospel. And I think it's one of the best ways to understand it. It's famous now. He said this about the gospel. He says, we are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dare believe. Yet at the very same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope. Surrender your small admissions. Admit that you are worse than you think. And surrender your ambitions. Confess that, that what you've been asking God for is way too little. Because life in God will require more than you think you need to give, but it'll also give you more than you, you think it offers. Okay, that's how this works. All right, C.S. Lewis, he wrote this book called Mere Christianity. When I was a younger Christian, I figured that I would become a wise Christian intellectual. And so I picked up this book by C.S. Lewis called Mere Christianity. And I'm just going to tell you guys, it kicked my butt. Like, I just could not hang with this guy. But there was one story that he told here that, that slaps. I think it goes with what we're saying. So he says this in, in his book, Mere Christianity. He says, imagine yourself as a living house. God comes in to rebuild that house. 
At first, perhaps you can understand what he's doing. He's getting the drains right and stopping the leaks in the roof and so on. You knew that those jobs needed doing, and so you're not surprised. But presently, he starts knocking the house about in a way that hurts abominably and does not seem to make any sense. What on earth is he up to? The explanation is that he is building quite a different house from the one you thought of. Throwing out a new wing here, putting on an extra floor there, running up towers, making courtyards. See, you thought you were being made into this decent little cottage. But he is building a palace. Why? Quote, he intends to come and live in it himself. When you guys clap when I quote other people, it's just weird. I don't know what to do with that. It's like, I'll clap too. See, maybe you wanted, you just wanted God to show up in your life, right? Maybe you just wanted God to visit, you know, to get you past your midterm, to help you get a job, to get you a husband. Maybe, maybe that's what you wanted. No, God says, I want everything. And in return, I will turn you into a palace. I've come to live here. See, I don't just want to renovate you. No, I want to rebuild your life beautifully from the ground up. That's what God is saying. God demands far more from you and will give you far more than you can imagine. He does. Amen. And so first, surrender your small admissions and ambitions. Second, sell everything else. I'll be quick on this one, but this one, this one hurts. So just buckle up a little bit. Sell everything else. You know, what it means to enter into the kingdom of God is to say, I am willing to sell everything. It means that you are able to look at anything in your life and you are able to say, nothing is more important than Jesus to me. I will suffer loss of anything to keep Jesus. Now, to, to use an example for this, if you're afraid to let people know that you're a Christian, if you are unwilling to publicly identify with Jesus Christ, then very possibly your image is more important to you. And what you're saying there, what you, what you very well may be saying there, is that I'm unwilling to sell. All right? Same thing with things like money, uh, things like your sexuality. Right? If, if you say, I want Jesus, but, in order, but if in order to be a Christian, I need to do this with my money, and I need to do that with my sexuality, then you're unwilling to sell, that, that I'm out. You're, you're saying, no, 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 I'm not giving up those things. Right? If you ever come to God and you say, I will obey God if, you ever done that? I will obey God if. Whatever's on the other side of that if is something that you are unwilling to sell. And so the question for you is, what is it? What are, like, just take a moment. What are you unwilling to sell? Because the kingdom of God will cost you everything you have. But is it expensive? No. It's a bargain. Now, let me just kind of let you guys into my, my head of, of how I think about this. Let me, just a question. Is $500 a lot of money to pay for something? Bada bing, okay? You guys just nailed it. It depends on what it is, right? If I told you that I wanted to give you the shoes off my feet for $500, would you, would you? They're not cheap, but they're not that expensive. I'll just tell you that. Let me be clear. Preachers and sneakers. I don't want to be on a website. Okay. Uh, the shoes off my feet. If I said $500, want it right now, what'd you guys say? No. 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 I'm telling you already. Wrong size. Wrong size. Fair enough. Fair enough. Okay. But if I brought to you a brand new car and said, you got $500, what would you say? Yes. And here's the deal. Let me reverse this. If you came to me with a brand new car and said, Sean, $500, and even if I didn't have a penny in my pocket or in my bank account, you know what I would say to you? Stay right here. In an hour, I'll come back and I will buy it. Right? Why? 
is because depending on what's being offered to you, like you'll pay whatever you have to pay to get it. Amen. You'll pay. And so the kingdom of God will cost you everything you have. Is it expensive? Not at all. Because even though I have to sell everything and impoverish myself to get it, it's a bargain. It's a bargain. Amen? Amen. Lastly, Preston and Joanne, you guys can come back. Uh, we got a kickball game to go win. I won't say anything else besides that. <laughs> Lastly, thank you. <laughs> Joyfully anticipate what God has in store for you. Joyfully anticipate what God has in store for you. See, these men had joy en route to selling everything, right? And it doesn't say that uh, the, the man in the first parable, it doesn't say that he felt joy when he received the deed for the land, right? Uh, it, it says that the joy came before he possessed it. This is important, so just follow me for the last couple minutes of this. It says that the joy came before he possessed it. And so the question begs, how can we, as believers, have joy when we see things sold off and liquidated in our lives? How can we as Christians have joy when we're constantly seeing that there's a cost to this life as a believer? How, how do we do this? Let me give you an answer. An answer is that we need to continually remind ourselves of our spiritual riches. We need to continually remind ourselves of our spiritual riches. Paul is a great example of this. Uh, you see this in the book of Acts, but he also talks about it uh, in the epistles, that Paul was a man who had been beaten, he was a man who was stoned. He was a man who was stripped of his uh, academic standing. But to the church in Rome, he said this. He said, I reckon, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed Hallelujah. to in us. Amen. What was Paul doing? Paul was counting his riches. He was counting his spiritual riches. This is what we need to do. You know, this is why we come to church. Yeah. We, we, we come to church. Every time we come to church, what we're doing, we're counting. We're telling one another about the benefits. We're telling each other about the things we already have and the things to come. This morning, my brother, Pat, he came to me and he said something that almost knocked me off my feet. Because I said something to him. I'm just going to tell on you right now, Pat. I said to him, I say, how are you doing? He said, hey, we go to a prophetic church. We don't ask people how they're doing. We tell them how they're doing. <laughs> Amen. I almost took my mic off and said, you're preaching today. <laughs> when we come to church, what we're, doing. we're counting. We're counting. When you open your Bible, you're counting it up. When you open, you sit down and you read, you're counting. You're reminding yourself of the treasures of being a believer. And one of the most beautiful and amazing things about being a believer that maybe we don't talk about enough, but one of the most amazing things about being a believer is that we can have joy even while our circumstances don't match our present reality. We can do that. As this man went away knowing he had to sell everything to get the field, he did it with joy. He did it with joy. Selling everything to him was nothing compared to what he was getting. It was nothing. Um, history tells us that the Apostle Andrew, um, now the Apostle Andrew, uh, there's not a ton said about him in scripture, right? We all know him as Peter's brother, right? His claim to fame to many of us you know, it was the fact that he introduced Peter to Jesus. But he was a whole lot more of that because history tells us that the apostle Andrew took the gospel to Greece where he was having so much success that he was eventually confronted by the leaders of that region. And the governor himself told him that you need to quit preaching immediately or else you'll be fastened to a cross. And I want you guys to hear his response. When he was threatened with this, he said this. He said, I would not preach the honor and glory of the cross if I feared the death of the cross. And so the sentence of death was pronounced 
And as Andrew was being carried out and led to the cross, as he was approaching it, as he saw it, as he walked towards it, he said this, oh, it's beautiful. He said, O oh, cross, most welcome and long anticipated, I come to you with a willing mind, with joy. Everyone say joy. With joy and desire. Since I am a follower and a student of the one who died on you, I have always loved you and sought to embrace you. He was going to his death and he said, oh, no, 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 no. I'm selling everything. Because what's to come is better than what's right now. He had joy before he fully possessed a treasure. And you and I can have the same. Amen. Surrender. Surrender the small stuff. Sell everything else. Joyfully anticipate everything God has for you. Amen. Stand with me. We're going to pray in a minute. But before we do, um, it's important for me to, to, to nail this truth in your heart and in my heart. That Jesus Christ is the pearl of great price. Jesus is the pearl of great price. See, many people see him and they, they think about him and there's a lot of scrutiny and there's a lot of indifference. But let me just tell you, there's a lot of people who see him and they fall to their knees in worship. Jesus is the treasure hidden in plain sight. Not only was he buried and raised so that he could be found by you, but Jesus traveled great length so that he could find you as well. Because on the cross, Jesus died for you and me. He died for us. And to save us and to bring us to God cost him everything. And yet the Bible says that for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Jesus had joy, just like the apostle Andrew, he had joy before he fully possessed the treasure. You know what the treasure is? It's you. It's you. It cost Jesus everything to get you, but to him, it was still a bargain. So with all heads bowed, all eyes closed, will you just consider this with me? Where are you today? Maybe like these men in the parable, you need to be illuminated that you need God to reveal to you the ultimate worth of what he's offering you in Christ. Maybe your admissions and your ambitions in them, you think you need a little bit and that you're being offered a little bit, but you need God to show you the real worth of the treasure that you've stumbled upon today. Or maybe you're realizing that there are things that you have been unwilling to sell to get what God is offering you. You've been unwilling to risk everything. And maybe you walk around, I just feel this by the Spirit of God, that maybe you're here and you've been questioning and trying to figure out and just saying, God, why, where are you? What's going on? What you going, what's going on? And I just wonder if, if there's things in your life that you have been unwilling to sell. You've been unwilling to risk everything. You've been unwilling to sacrifice everything. You've been unwilling to impoverish, impoverish yourself and to beggar yourself for this great salvation that God offers you. My prayer is that you're realizing there's no shortcuts. Lastly, maybe you're, uh, you're someone who has had a hard time reminding yourself of the joys. It's been hard to do that. You allow the, tr the, the, the treasure to get buried and even forgotten because of other things. 
So whoever you are, all across the room today, heads are bowed, eyes are closed, you're here today. And you would just say, Sean, I want to count it up today. I want this treasure to be mine. I am willing to sell everything. If you're here and that is your heart cry, raise your hand. We just want to pray for you. Amen. I see you, sister. I see you. I see you. See you in the back. I see you, sister. So hands all over the place. Oh, my goodness. Anyone else? About eight or nine hands. Anyone else? I see you, brother. I see you. I'll wait. Anyone else? Um, there's someone or there's multiple people here today that have gotten this thing confused and You've been given a false truth that this is about a destination. That this is about getting somewhere. The truth is that this is not about getting somewhere. This is not about a place. This is about who's at that place. Hmm. Jesus never said, pray this prayer and you'll get here. It's never in the Bible. He said the kingdom of God is at hand. Hmm. He wants to put his life in you. He wants to put his life in you. He didn't come for your sins. He came for his sons. He didn't come for your destruction. He came for his daughters. So if you're here today and you're believing the identity that you are a sinner, that you are a destroyer. Maybe in the world's eyes you are. But Jesus was not looking through world's eyes. Colossians 3, 1 through 4 says, Set your mind on the things of Christ who's seated at the right hand of the Father. Set your eyes on the things above, not on the things below. He never looked at you through earthly eyes or through hellish eyes. You're a son and a daughter. Come on. So we'll do one more call. If you're here today and you've been believing that you are a sinner or a destroyer and that's how Jesus sees you and he sees you as damaged goods or he sees you as not good enough, but you're saying, hey, I'm ready to accept my identity as a son. I'm ready to accept my identity as a daughter. I'm ready to start living heaven here on earth. Come on. I'm ready to start terrorizing hell every single day of my life here on earth. I'm ready to start being a part of heaven's repo company. I'm ready to start taking back land for my dad, for my God, for my Lord, my Savior. Raise your hand right now. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. This is a call for people who have believed that they're believers for a long time. This is a call for people who don't identify as believers. This is for you. Jesus paid a price to get his life in you. Jesus paid a price to redeem you and restore you. Nothing here on earth is better. Yeah. Nothing here on earth is better. Yeah. Sell everything. Amen. Sell everything. So our prayer team is going to come forward. Don't leave here without handling business today. Amen. Um, let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for your people. I thank you for those who, even for those who raised their hand for the first time and for today, for the first time said, yes, I want to sell everything. Yes, I want this pearl of great price. Spirit of God, would you testify to them that you have come in? Hmm. And I thank you, Lord, that though we cannot with our own words and our own intellect beat upon the hearts of people to be let in, Lord, I thank you that from the inside you can unlock it. And so for those who have opened that door and have allowed you to sit with them and suck with them, Lord, finish that work now. 
forgive them of their sins, cleanse them of all unrighteousness, testify to them that you have made them a child of God. And for those of us who have been walking with you for a long time, Lord, help us to never forget to count up the riches. On a day like today where we refuse to forget and we will always remember what happened, may it also be a day where we remember what you have done for us as well, Jesus. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name.